Praise the Lord for this morning. And uh, this whole year, God is going to unpack a lot of things. And when I say God is going to unpack a lot of things, it's going to be very exciting. It's not only going to be fun, but it's going to be Holy Spirit fun. Amen? Amen? Now, that being said, can I just ask everyone to just close your eyes? Close your eyes and bow your heads. Can we just come to God and just say and pray? You also pray for me. Holy Spirit, I pray. Would you please override the first 750 words and the entire message for this day? That from the beginning note to the last note, we would only see the glory of God. Father, this is not about us, but this is about you. And so, Father, we ask that you fill every empty space in our hearts. This is a good time to begin the year. Believing that God can help us through. I surrender myself to you, dear Father. There's nothing in me, only Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity and privilege to be, to be able to serve you through the preaching of your holy word. Just like the angels, I come to you. I am not worthy. Just like Isaiah when he said, I belong to a generation with unclean lips. And so, Father, surrendering everything this very moment. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. It's going to be a good start. Just recently... The whole country, especially the big church, celebrated what we call the Panata 2024. Now, if you're wondering what is this Panata, in English, it's called a vow. Okay, a vow. A commitment, a consecration of your life. Incidentally, this country, because of our background with religiosity, this country pours into one place. It's called Kiapo. You remember that? <laughs> well, I'm not promoting that. What I'm just saying is the whole country of the Philippines, part of the religious culture of the Filipinos is they usually would come to God on the first week of the year. So meaning it is embedded in you that you know that God is in operation. And when he is in operation, then I want to get connected on the first of the year. Right? That's why it's called the panata. Let me show you the picture. What it looks like to have a panata in the Philippines, in Quiapo. It happened last week. You see that? Well, I'm not promoting that. I'm just trying to make you understand that you and I, really Filipinos, are thinking about their relationship with God. And my prayer this morning, and that you might genuinely think of your standing before God right now. Not a, uh, not a devotion to an image, like in this case, but a, a devotion to a living God. If you have your Bibles with you, let me drive your, your attention to Joshua chapter 3, verse 5 through 8. And Kuya Jai just uh, cut the verses because it's too long. Here's what the Bible says. This is what Pijap gave me. And this is what the Holy Spirit worked through, the week, uh, through this week. Then Joshua told, told the people, purify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do great wonders among you. Wow, very interesting. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, Lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. 
And so they started out and went ahead of the people. Verse 7. Then the Lord told Joshua today. I will begin to make you or exalt you or lift you up. A great leader in the eyes of all Israelites. They will know that I am with you. Just as I was with Moses. Verse 8. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River. Take a few steps into the river and stop there. If I go back to that picture that I showed you, very interesting because in the scripture we have the same scenario. This time it's not the beginning of the year, but it's the beginning of a long promise that God has given from one leader to another. You remember who's the boss of Joshua? The boss of Joshua is Moses. But Moses died in the wilderness. All right? And so right now, Joshua, not an accidental leader, but God has picked him particularly because, not because he's special, but because he's a willing, full-time heart. I call it full-time heart. He's not just a full-time worker of Moses, but he has this full heart to serve God through the leadership of Moses. In the Bible, we have a similar scene, but not ritualistic. A devotion to commit one's life to the living God by faith. The story of Joshua and the crossing of the Jordan River, it's actually the story of God in recognizing and weaponizing the faith of a leader. In fact, when I try to study the text, I'd see that this is a good text for leadership. Usually, this is how God operates. If God is going to do something for the, for, for the people of Israel, He is going to talk through things through the leader. And then the leader will divulge everything, will open up everything to the people to follow and listen to the instruction. That's how God operated. The same is the case with, Mo, uh, with, with Moses and Joshua right here. It's like, if God is going to catapult Rockfish Church into something bigger than us, God has to, number one, deal with the leader. And then the leader will have to re-echo everything to the followers. Are we getting everything right? That's why leadership is very important. But in here, God is making it very sure that he recognizes the faith. Of a leader. Alright? I know you are planning to work on your lives this 2024. If you're going to navigate life 2024, can I just ask you to follow the cue of Joshua, the leader? Okay? Can I just ask you to just open your heart and think about this hardly and deeply inside. I am going to navigate 2024 with my family, my desires, my vision, my mission, whatever it is. Maybe my work, my business, or my personal lives. I ask you to please take the advice and the command of Joshua. Why? Because 2024, God is going to do something that is greater than what you think. God is going to do something that is beyond you, beyond me, beyond us. And when I refer to the church, God is going to do something beyond Rockfish Church. Especially our mission here, not just here, but the entire archipelago of the country. God is going to be doing something. But before God would do something, here's what Joshua has to say. 
He says, be set apart. Be set apart. This is not just a story of crossing the Jordan River. And you might think this is just a story because this is historical in effect. But this is the story of God unfolding himself. God unfolding himself in the life of a leader. Whom he lies for something greater than himself. This is the story of God recognizing the faith that he has as a leader. And this is actually the story of every one of us willing to be set aside for his purpose. Let's talk about project set aside. Let's talk about project set aside. Now, I want you to understand, Jordan crossing is not merely a project. I just call it a project, okay? It's just me, the flesh in art, okay? And I want you to understand, you're not just a project. You're something more than that. You're very special. All right? God has placed his eyes on you. That's why you have that relationship with him right now. But talking about this, I also want you to understand that when you navigate life, it begins through a solid foundation. So my encouragement this morning Build your life on the foundation that is not made by man, but by God himself. Now, let me illustrate what I'm trying to say. Look at this building. This is Burj Khalifa. As of 2023, it's the highest building in the world. I am not an engineer. I just got this, you know. I did not make up. I, I did not make it up, but in our discipleship process, we use this process. When you look at the building, the outside part, the height, everything, the width and everything, you call it the structure. You appreciate the structure, right? Wow, that building is so tall. Wow, that building is beautiful. Those are the kinds of words when you look at the structure. But when you look at the substructure, you get into the building and you get to see, you know, this, this beams right here. You, you, you get to see how the minds of the architect and the engineers had, you know, the complication. They made it so intricately beautiful. We call it the superstructure. It's when you go into a building and you ride the elevator and you say, oh, wow, it's like a train. Well, I haven't been to this building but maybe one day God will bring you to that place and you remember this. Now when you see the structure and the superstructure, they're all beautiful. Believe it or not. All those are just facade. All those are just for show. The most important part of Khalifa Burj building is the substructure. The substructure. The foundation. Why? If you are building your life by your choices and decisions, please work on the substructure, the foundation. Why? Because when you try to understand, okay, well, when, when, when winds and waves and even surge, you know, we don't understand the word surge until Yolanda happened. It's when this huge wind brought all this water into Yolanda. It's 21 feet high. And we have more than 10,000 dead. The whole city of Tacloban was destroyed. That was 2013. Am I right? That's where I first realizes how damaging is surge. The, the surge was. So when the wind comes and it blows big time, the foundation is not shaken. Recently, the Philippines have experienced a lot of earthquake, especially in the southern part of the Philippines, Mindanao, Davao, uh, Surigao, and so on. Seems like to me they're, they're the favorite, huh? 
But when everything is shaken, when your foundation is so solidly founded, I tell you, on top you see the structure and the substructure moving, but it's not collapsing. Why? It's easy to predict. Why? Because the foundation is so, so solid. Navigate your life on sand 2024, and I tell you, the whole year you'll be crying. You will be overtaken by the wind and the waves. You'll be overtaken by intensities of life. But if you build your life on the solid foundation and his name is Jesus, you're indestructible. These are the observations I got from this text. It's very interesting to note in this passage, so that we can better understand the background, God always has a plan. Okay, can you tell your seatmate? God has a plan. <laughs> can you tell your seatmate? God has a plan. <laughs> Never make that mistake. God is not in the mini, mini, mini mo in heaven. He has a plan. It's not in the text, but... You remember Jeremiah 29, 11, your favorite text? What well, does it say? For I know the plans. You know, if, if I would chop that verse, you'd realize that God is unfolding himself in front of his people and saying, hey, I'm not making second guess about your life. Hindi ako nangunghula. I'm not making second, second guess about your future. I'm not making second guess about your destiny. I am making it very sure because the word no, it's not just his mind to think, but his heart to love. And he says, for I know the plans I have for you. God has a plan for my life. I was running around as a young boy, 11 years old, in the orphanage in, in Subic. But God knew from the beginning that he has a plan for me. I wanted to become a medical doctor, but no, God has a better plan. His plan is to make me a preacher of God's word. His plan is that my lips would bring healing to people. I don't know about you. But the Holy Spirit's goal right now is to convince you that He has a plan for you. And His plan is perfect. His plan is good. The master of the universe at one point in, 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 his, in his office and said, oh, I saw Jeffrey Hoagland and Tonya Hoagland from across America come in. <laughs> now we have Pastor Tony, another victim. <laughs> hey, not to say the least, we have Skyler, another victim. <laughs> when he talks, he loves the country. He loves the Philippines, right? The Filipino in him. Woo! Come on. But here's the good thing. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, God has a perfect plan for your life. If God has planned something beautiful for me, then I might as well align my plan to his plan. Amen? It's always easy to have your own plan. But remember, the final signatory is Jesus himself. Amen? He's the last to sign. So my advice, just plan it. Plan it and ask the Lord, Lord, bless this plan. And when he signs it, he gives his signature, go for it. And here is the case of Joshua. Joshua is a novice leader. He just took on a generation. He, <laughs> the boss is dead. What's going to happen now? What am I supposed to do now? Moses is dead. But you know what? Although it's not part of my outline, but I want to impress in your heart, and the Holy Spirit is talking right now, in verse 7, can you show that verse right away? 
in verse 7, here's what God told Joshua. Listen, look at this, look at this. No, 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 verse 7, you go back. Verse 7, this is what God told Joshua. <laughs> and I want you to understand this. The Lord told Joshua, it was God speaking. Hey, everybody, it's God speaking. All right? It's God speaking. And maybe right now it's the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. The Lord is telling you something right now. Or maybe the Lord is telling Pastor Jeff right now. Maybe Pastor Tony right now. Maybe Norman right now. And all the leaders that are here. Uh, Julius, the youth leader. Everybody, all those who in leadership right now. God is telling you something. Hey, today I am going to make a credential out of you. You don't know what Moses did. You just saw it, right? You've experienced being with him. And you're the best, uh, the, the yes man guy. But here, it's different. I will do it with you. And he says, I'm, I will begin to make you a great leader. I don't know what's the translation. Maybe a great leader is bringing them to the promised land. Right? I don't know. I don't know what's going to be with you. Maybe a father here is thinking right now, I'm a leader of my family. I'm going to bring my family to the promised land. And not only that, not only that, the credential is not finished yet. I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites, all this new generation. All these people, they will recognize. What will they recognize? Will they recognize your talent? Well, definitely, Joshua is a brilliant military tactician. Remember, he's a spy. He was one of those two boys, Joshua and Caleb the dog, were sent to check the promised land. And all of the 12 people, both of them have the same news. Oh, yes, it's true. They're going to be giant in the place. But there's milk and honey in the place. <laughs> there are leaders who would always see the negative, but there are leaders who see the purpose of God in every situation. And this is the type of Joshua. They will know that I am with you. You take everything in the text. I'll just take God is with me. Can you tell your sick mate right now? God is with you. Sounds familiar? You remember December when one of the pastors talked about Emmanuel? It says God with us. He's not just around me, but he is in me. You take away everything in the equation. You just take that last part right there. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. God is referring to a credential he created in the life of Moses. And right now he is more than willing to make another credential. A unique one. Moses drove the people out of Egypt through the Red Sea. But this time Joshua is going to bring the people from Jordan River to the promised land. Amen? You might be thinking about your promised land right now, but your promised land right now starts by recognizing that God is in you. Amen? You talk to me, okay? That's what PJP is always asking. You talk to me. Remember the first 750 words to the last note of the message? Let's get connected. The Holy Spirit is talking in the middle. Okay? These people were a new generation. Why? Because the old all died, including Moses. You know why they died? <laughs> According to the text, not just they were old, but basically they were disobedient. They were not able to go through the promised land. They don't like instructions. They, they want the easy way out. You know, they always want to cry out, hey, Moses, why are you bringing us here? To kill us? 
they're not able to see the big picture. Hey guys, when you navigate 2024, this is what I want to tell you. The big picture is that God with you and He is leading you. Stop complaining about your situation. I think almost 7 billion people today are complaining with what's happening in the world. The unemployment in the Philippines, we thought by electing a new president, our economy would, would blow up. No, the hope of this country belongs to God. Oh, okay, I'm not going to politics, okay? <laughs> All right? <laughs> I love Ilocanos, you know that. <laughs> I love all Filipinos, but I speak Visayan. Right? I love all people. Given the opportunity, I'm going to serve all people. But here, Jesus loves everyone. He cares for everybody. That's not part of the note. This new generation with Joshua right now, they have not seen the Red Sea uh, crossing. That's noteworthy. They don't know what it is to see that biggest aquarium in the world. In the Philippines, we have one. I don't find, what, what do you call that, Pastor Jean? In, in Pasay, you went there. Ocean Park. You know, when I go to heaven, I would joke around with Jesus and say, Hey, Lord, can you show me the crossing of the Red Sea? Because I want to see all those blue whales on the side. The biggest aquarium in all the world. And only those Israelites were able to say it. Unfair. But hey. Joshua is going to experience and the generation next to him another experience. Joshua saw the Red Sea crossing. This time, God is going to allow him to experience the Jordan River crossing. Right? There are two guarantees. When you build your life in the foundation of God. When you build your life on the fact that you know that God is with you. Okay? Number one, build the substructure so solid that intensity surge will not be able to destroy your foundation. Number two, trust his plan for, your, uh, for this 2024 and you will never go wrong. Are you willing to trust his plan for you this year? And I'm telling you, you will never go wrong. You've trusted so much. Many of you, you have 2023, I'm going to gather all my money because I'm going to buy my iPhone. What's the latest? iPhone 15. But that was very new, right? <laughs> PJ, we only have Samsung here. <laughs> right? And then you thought that it's going to be eternity. Oh, yeah, I'm going to hold my iPhone. Oh, I spent so much for this, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm telling you, it'll fail you. Technology fails you. You notice that every Sunday? <laughs> For whatever reason, Pastor Jeb will have that problem with the microphone. <laughs> Technology fails you. I have a good news for you. Jesus will not. <laughs> and I, I, I'm not joking. Jesus will not fail you. Okay, now let me clarify. There may be your wants and his desires. Sometimes we complicate the two. When I say Jesus will not fail you, he will not fail you with his desires. Usually you come up to him and say, Lord, I need your signature. Lord, here's my plan. I don't know what your plan is, but here. Can I just give it to you and I need a signature. I am not usually uh, asking the Lord for a sign, but this year I'm asking him for a sign. Lord, what are you going to do with my life and my wife's life? What are you going to do with us? <laughs> Woo! 
let's laugh, okay? Come on, everybody, let's just laugh about it, all right? Oh, technology will not win over the plan of Jesus, amen? <laughs> so don't pass your hopes in technology. <laughs> no, number two. <laughs> number two, okay? Number one, you know that God has a plan for you, amen? Hey, young people, do not rush. He has a plan for you. Amen? Now, if you are in a relationship right now, praise the Lord for at least you know someone loves you and you love that person. Amen? Okay, dad and moms, I'm not trying to violate you. What I'm trying to say is, can stop them. They will lie all the time. So this is what I told my kids. Don't lie to me. You tell me the truth. You tell me the truth. Every time Kuya AJ would keep silent about his relationship, it goes down. <laughs> so young people, you know your boundaries when you are in a relationship. You know that easily the enemy can overtake you when you're not wise, right? <laughs> Parents, don't be over paranoid with your children. Okay? Give, him, give them a little bit of freedom. But when you're not in the church, how can you do that? Okay? Number two. Challenges are part of the process. Yes, 2024 will be difficult. It will have a lot of challenges. What I'm telling you, it's going to be sweet because you're with Jesus. It's, all, it's always better to walk with Jesus than alone. So for the single that are here right now, can I just say this? You have Jesus as your boyfriend. Amen? Oh. It's not popular. They don't like it. <laughs> they don't like it. But let me go back to Joshua. Let me go back to Joshua. During this time, you know why did I say that there are challenges along the way? It's very evident in the text. It's right there. It's so amazing because during this time, God commissioned Joshua to instruct, command the people to consecrate but then this is during the harvest season well I don't have the map to show you but let me illustrate Jordan is not difficult to cross compared to the Red Sea but you know why it's difficult for the people and Joshua also realizes the danger that they are going to have maybe the strong can cross but the weak will not be able to do it why during the harvest season, the water in Jordan River is overflowing and it's rushing down. It's raging. It's very dangerous to cross. Ha! Ah, now you're thinking, why would God in his mind give an instruction to cross during the harvest season? There is this dry season, Lord. Why not we cross during the dry season? No sweat. We'll just cross it. And then we're fine. But that's not how God works. That's always the easy tour. Right? That's always the easy route for you. No. God is not doing power tripping when he asks Joshua to instruct the people. God is actually impressing the fact that he operates, uh, operates on the impossibilities. God wants Joshua to, to think, hey Joshua, you've got to have faith in what I'm saying. And you've got to instruct these people to believe just like what I did with Moses. I've done this. I've seen it. I, I made this. And so I am asking you to cross even during this time. 
because I operate in the impossibilities. That's who your God is. Now, let me unpack a little bit of an application here. 2024, the thing with all of us is we don't know what's going to happen after the preaching. They said 15 minutes after the preaching, it's all gone. How's that? Honestly, after we go out, we don't know what's going to happen. And I'm not going to tell you the next line. Okay? 2024, navigating the whole year, you really don't know. Only God knows. All right? And too many of you, you may think it's impossible. To some of you, I need an increase, but I don't know if he's even, is, is he even going to give it? But Joshua knew. Joshua knows the words of his God, of his ultimate leader. He knows that God is creating something not just through him, but to all the people. He is driving all the people to believe in him. It's always easy for us to say, I believe in God. But when things are turning not our way, when things are working not on our advantage, we shy away. We moved out. We collapse. We snap. Just like that. We, why? Because we want everything easy. When Joshua was standing right there and the raging water was up there, in my opinion, what's running in the mind of Joshua is the actual experience of the Red Sea crossing. God is not going to make a mistake. He has done this. He has a record of it. It's not even a hundred years ago that he did the same thing. There will be challenges. But you know that these challenges are part of the process. Let me tell you this. Faith cannot coexist with fear. Last Sunday, oh, that was solid. That was solid. Living faith. I'm telling you, if you have faith, you don't have fear. If you have fear, you don't have faith. They cannot go together. They are not in a relationship. They quarrel. They fight. And so the thing with Joshua here, I'd rather have faith in my mind and in my heart rather than lead these people into fear. You see, this is a leadership call. He can drive the people into fear, but in this case, he is driving the people into faith. In the text, when I observe it and try to study all the details of it, it's very clear that the people were submissive of his command. Remember, this was the first command of Joshua as a leader to his people. There were no grumblings. It's not like in the time of Moses when everybody is so intelligent, but they lack God in their intelligence. When everybody is saying practically this and that, this and that, blah, 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 and everything. You know what? When you have someone in the room who's always good with the blah, 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 I'm telling you, shut the person up with the fact that God is in the mood all the time. Oh, thank you, guys. Let me just preach right here. <laughs> Do you agree that God is in the mood all the time? Even when you don't understand it. Even when you don't say it. Uh, here's what I learned. Faith is just like a step in the dark. Would you take it? You don't know if there's a, 
next level. This I can see. But faith is the whole eyes right there. It's a step in the dark. But you know what? The dark there, it's the hand of God that's going to bring you to your next level. Amen? It's very clear. Joshua believed with all his heart, his mind, his being that God is going to bring them to the next level. The next level is the promised land. So I tell you, trust the process. Trust the process. It may be difficult, there may be challenges, but you trust the process. Why? Because the one who created the process is God. Amen? Hey, hey, hey. The one who created the process is God. He was the one talking. Is that an amen? Amen. Number three. I started with verse 7. It's interesting. I'm going back to verse 5. Because the whole text is about Joshua as a leader. But being a leader, he has to talk through to his people. He has to lead his people. And his first message to his people. It's just like, Happy New Year! My first message for the year is consecrate! My first message for the year is set apart. That's the word for consecrate. And we call this project set apart. This year, God is going to slice some people and set them apart for a greater purpose. That's the idea of consecrate. And the whole Israelite race, the generation with Joshua, understood what's the message when he said... Consecrate yourselves today. And he said, next week, God is going to do great wonders. No, he said, next year, 2025, God is going to do wonders. No, next five years, God is going to do wonders. No, very immediate. He said, consecrate yourselves now and tomorrow, I am going to do wonders in your journey. Come on. Come on, everybody. (laughs) Do you realize the distance when, you know, the time frames when Joshua was talking to the people? Hey, guys, you know what? I have good news, and the good news is this. Consecrate your your, your lives today. Hey, tomorrow we're going to cross Jordan River. And I'm going to do great wonders. You don't understand wonders. When God or when Joshua was talking about wonders, he was talking about the dividing of the Red Sea according to his experience with Moses. And this generation had no clue about that. It's just like you and me. When we are not experiencing God in our walk with him. That's why we have Matthew chapter 5. When, the, when Jesus would teach the disciples. When Jesus would teach the disciples. The Lord's prayer. And says. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth. As it is in heaven. How much of heaven is happening here on earth right now? That's the kind of wonder that Jesus taught the disciples. There's going to be something that is so, so huge and so, so great that is going to happen. Maybe in your small prayer. Prayer for your family. Prayer for your future. Prayer for everything that you desire and you come to God. And He is preparing that wonder for you. He says, Purify yourselves. 
set yourselves apart. Sanctify. Make me holy. That's the idea of consecration. It's not every day that someone will come to you or Pastor Jeff will come to you and talk to you about holiness. Holiness comes in two ways. Let me unpack. Number one, holiness is a gift from God. When you receive Jesus Christ, it's called positional holiness. It's not in you, but when God saved you, when you have that relationship, He gave that to you. And then another thing is the practical holiness. It is the manifestation of what God has worked in in your everyday life. That is practical holiness. And both ways, Joshua is talking to his people, hey guys, you are positionally holy and I want you to be set apart. I want you to be away from all your anxiety. I want you, I'm not making it soft. Let me just say this. I want you to be away with your sons. I want you to be disconnected with all the strongholds that you have. I want you to be disconnected from selfish desires. I want you to be disconnected with your immaturity. I want you to be disconnected with everything that turns away the Holy Spirit in your lives. I want those out of your lives. That's the idea of consecrate here. No promised land, no breakthrough when there's no consecration. When God would ask something for His people, He would always ask them to draw to Him. When God asked the Israelites to consecrate themselves because He's going to do great things, He's trying to tell them, I am uncomfortable with your sinful lives. I am uncomfortable with your, I am not comfortable with your, with, with, with the things that you, with the way you do things. This time I want you to do things the way I want you. This time let me make this decision. Let me make myself very clear. I want you to set aside yourself for the greatest that I am going to make for you as a nation. I am going and I am willing to bless you with the promised land. But you have to consecrate yourself. You have to give yourself. You have to give yourself to God. Today I ask you. In the name of God. It begins. With a decision by faith. To consecrate your life. If you are here for the first time and you have not you have not got that relationship with Jesus. You don't have that relationship with Jesus. I'm talking about you and Jesus. Yes, I don't know if I have a relationship with Jesus. I'm listening to this message right now and it's very clear the Holy Spirit is working but I don't know. I'm not sure if I have that relationship with Jesus. This is the time for you. Can I see that hand? Can I see that hand? I want to have that relationship with Jesus right here. Anyone else? I want, that, I want to have that relationship with Jesus. Anyone else? If you don't know and if you don't have that relationship with Jesus right now, I want to see that hand. Come on. I know it's more than the hand that you lift. Someone is going to get into you and talk to you through about this. You need to get that relationship with Jesus right now. To cross 2024, your Jordan River, you need that relationship with Jesus right now. Anyone else? Anyone else? I'm not seeing a hand. Praise the Lord right here. Right here. You're making the best decision of your life to give your life into a relationship with Jesus. Anyone else? Right there. Praise the Lord. You're making the right decision. Giving your life to Jesus. Anyone else? Right there at the back. Jesus, Jesus doesn't care if you're your mom or your dad, young people. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. 
someone will come to you later and will talk to you. The relationship starts by believing that He died for you. He is God, took the form of a man, and He went up to the cross, died. He rose up so that you can have that new life in Jesus Christ. And He said He's coming back so that He fulfilled the promise. This Jesus doesn't lie. He cannot lie to himself. He is God. What he said is true and it's going to happen. The next part of the invitation is I realize I failed God big time. I realize I'm the greatest moron of all time. I'm, I realize I'm the greatest wasted of all time. And I'm not talking about my dad. I'm not talking about someone else. I'm not talking about my abuser. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about me. If you are running away from something, the promised land is so, so far because you are holding on that something. You can't move. You can't take the command. You can't take the instruction. Why? Because you're still holding on that something. I call it the stronghold. I, I call it the, the, the unforgiveness. I, I, I call it the dragons that you have created inside of you. Uh, I, I call it the sin that we so accustomed. The sin that we love to do and we come again and again and do it again and again and again and again. And this sin would always topple us down. This sin takes away our identity that baggage that you have right now here I want you to let go by faith and in the power of the Holy Spirit you can't do it alone you need him he's going to help you he's your helper the Holy Spirit is your helper he wants to help you drop it young man mom dad drop it it's not part of the equation. God wants to bring you to your next level. Your next level happens when you drop it right now. Hey guys, I'm going to drop it. I don't know with you. It's your decision now. I don't want to set up anything contrary to what the Holy Spirit is setting up right now. We don't want any theatrics. I just want to flow in that power. The power of the Holy Spirit. When you come freely on your will and come and surrender everything. And I'm telling you, I've been doing this job for the last year. 33 years but I'm still willing and I'm still willing to drop everything and say I follow only Jesus for my 2024 no one and nothing else not even my paycheck I'm gonna follow him and he's asking you to follow him right now hey guys I'm gonna drop it